Hello there. I am Frank Zindler, the Central Ohio Director of the Society of Separationists, an organization dedicated to the maintenance of the separation wall between church and state. Welcome to part two of our special program entitled The Case of Big Daddy. For those of you who missed the first part of this program, Big Daddy is this little comic book, an anti-evolutionary comic book which is very widely distributed. This comic book is copyrighted by Mr. Jack Chick of Chick Publications and the copyright was obtained in 1972. As we saw in the last uh, part of this show, uh, actually substantial parts of this comic book were taken from a book written considerably earlier, a book written by F. Clark Powell. Uh, this is a Time Life publication, and this was copyright by Time Life Incorporated in 1965 and again in 1967. Uh, we saw in the first part of this program that substantial parts of this book were taken. Pictures, for example, there's a fold-out which we'll look at in a little while, that substantial parts of this book were taken without attribution and were then used in the comic book Big Daddy. This comic book, Big Daddy, is ubiquitous. We find it everywhere. I don't know exactly how many copies of this have been printed since 1972, but certainly this is to be found everywhere, in every fundamentalist bookstore from Maine to Guam, uh, every fundamentalist church. I get copies of this gratis uh, in the mail with anonymous uh, letters and so forth. This is probably one of the most widely distributed pieces of propaganda that has ever been printed uh, against the theory of evolution. Uh, as a matter of fact, whenever you read in your local newspaper letters from fundamentalist preachers attacking the theory of evolution, the chances are very good that part of their letter will actually uh, contain material which they have gotten from this comic book. I would not think this very important, except that this little comic book makes, for many people, their only contact with evolutionary ideas. Evolution is hardly taught anymore in the public schools of America because of the great pressure put upon high school science teachers and school boards by the fundamentalists who are pushing their special brand of fundamentalism, which they call creation science, which of course I think is a contradiction in terms. But anyway, because this is for many people their only contact with evolutionary ideas, I think it is important to examine this. The plot of the comic book is pretty simple. It starts with a buffoon of a biology professor, a real weirdo, uh, starting his class by saying, how many of you believe in evolution? And the thunderous uh, uh, response, almost everybody in the class says, we believe, all except for one Pat Boone type of student who says, no, he doesn't believe in evolution, rather he believes in a literal reading of the Bible. And the professor loses his temper, threatens to throw this poor student out, and then decides to let him stay just so that he can ridicule his beliefs. Well, as you may imagine, in the course of this comic book, the student is shown to know way more biology than the biology professor. He finally convinces the biology professor that evolution just cannot be true, and uh, the biology professor leaves the class allowing the student to convert all of his classmates to fundamentalist Christianity, which is, after all, the purpose of creation science anyway. It's just there to try to soften people up so that they can be converted to a fundamentalist Christianity. Um, copyright requirements um, prevent us from going square by square through the entire comic book. I would love to be able to do that to show you exactly at each step of the way what, what tricks are being pulled on you. But we can't do that. Fortunately, however, the fair use clause in the copyright law, in the new copyright law, does allow us to use a certain number of uh, excerpts from the comic book uh, for purposes of 
criticism and review, and that we will continue to do. We had started that in the first part of this program. Uh, although Mr. Chick denies that he himself evolved, uh, we do have very good evidence that his comic book, Big Daddy, did evolve from the Time Life book, which we showed you a moment ago. As a matter of fact, it took early man, that is the book, somewhere between five and six years to evolve into Big Daddy. Uh, <clears throat> in our previous uh, part of this show, we examined some of the pictures in the fold-out, an evolutionary sequence um, that uh, we found in the Time Life book, and we showed how in uh, the comic book, many of these uh, had their names changed and uh, were in other ways distorted. We will continue to look at the evolutionary sequence and the parody of it uh, in the comic book uh, in this program. But before we, before we do that, I want to draw your attention to some other fallacies which are to be found in this, in this comic book. One of the more interesting uh, things that Chick does is he tries to attack uh, radiocarbon dating. Now, <clears throat> radiocarbon dating is not terribly important in evolutionary studies. It's of great significance in archaeological studies, but in evolutionary studies, radiocarbon dating is not very significant because it can only date things back to 30 or 40,000 years uh, before the present. So it's not terribly critical. But creationists tend to make a big to-do about radiocarbon dating. There is one square um, in this cartoon, which I will just read to you. We won't show it. Our student says, evolutionists tested by the potassium-argon method, strata in which Leakey's Nutcracker Man was found and reported to be one and three-quarter million years old. Now, at this point, there is a footnote in the comic book uh, documenting that date of one and three-quarter million years. Curiously, the footnote is to the journal called Radiocarbon, and it says it is in volume 11, 1969, and it gives no page number. The text continues, bones found below that stratum, which should be older, turned out to be only 10,000 years old. And then there is a footnote uh, a second footnote to that, and that refers us to something called the Creation Research Society Quarterly, dated June 1970 and page 60. And we continue in this same cartoon. It says, by the carbon-14 test, that was 10,000 years old, which is right. Dr. Whitelaw, a professor in nuclear engineering, I hope you're sufficiently impressed, a professor in nuclear engineering claims it to be less than 7,000 years. And then there is a third footnote, and this appears to refer also to radiocarbon. Uh, it says IBID, and then it says page 65. Well, I, at some uh, difficulty, managed to obtain uh, the journal Radiocarbon for 1969. I was intrigued at why a, radio, a, a potassium argon date would be written up in uh, this, this journal, radiocarbon, which has nothing to do with, with potassium argon. And of course, since there was no page number, I had to go through this entire, this entire journal. There is no index to this journal. Basically, the journal is just an endless series of specimens that have been dated by radiocarbon. And it tells you where the materials came from and what dates uh, were obtained. Well, there was, no, there was no thing in here about radiocarbon, uh, about uh, potassium argon. Uh, I did, however, find one section in there, one date, having to do with a dating at Old Duvai Gorge, where Louis B. Leakey's uh, researches have been done. And uh, interestingly to say, in that, uh, we come up with something that is 10,000 years old. So the number matches. The only problem is, instead of that date being for strata that are below the level of Zinjanthropus, or Nutcracker Man, a very, very primitive uh, hominid, uh, instead of it being for strata below that, as the comic book tells us, it was the very highest level 
strata, in the very highest level strata. As a matter of fact, that date uh, is given as marking the beginning of the modern period. So we see a very serious distortion uh, in, in this comic book. Well, it's not a distortion, it's just, just plain made up. Um, so this carbon-14 dating thing uh, with regard to radiocarbon in the journal uh, is, is completely wrong. But we don't stop there. The next square, the student is really going to clinch this to tell us that radiocarbon dating is no good. He says, sir, this actually happened. Tissue from a living mollusk was tested for carbon-14 and found to be dead for 3,000 years. And the class is going nuts. They're saying, beautiful, and they're laughing, out of sight, and the thing was still alive, and they're carrying on. And the poor old professor is thinking to himself, he says, I'm getting sick. There is a footnote to this also. And this is a footnote to the journal Science, a very prestigious journal, volume 141, page 636, August 16th, 1963. Now notice that the date, 1963, is already old at the time that the comic book is being written, which is copyright 1972. It's almost 10 years old. And for a science such as carbon dating or radiometric dating of any sort, 10 years is really quite a bit of time. A lot of developments can occur in that amount of time. Well, I was curious as to why he would refer to something that old. So I went and I got the journal for that date. And uh, I mean, the, the impression you get, of course, is that this technique is so, so stupid, so useless, that you can't tell something that's still alive from something that's supposedly been dead 3,000 years. Well, it turns out that the original magazine, the original article in Science, was an article which was showing people how to avoid serious errors in radiocarbon dating. And it showed that if mollusks are dated, and if these mollusks have been living in waters that are exposed to limestones, limestone having a type of fossil carbon in it, uh, because of this fossil carbon contamination, a mollusk living in that water will appear to be 3,000 years old, even if it is still alive. And in some cases, of course, it could even appear to be older than that. So we see a very serious distortion here. We have a, a, a paper which was originally designed to show scientists how to avoid errors, showing them that they must not use uh, mollusks from such an environment to get radiocarbon dates. And in the comic book Big Daddy, this is twisted around in such a way as to make the reader think that radiocarbon dating won't work and scientists are so dumb that they go on using it uh, even though it gives false dates. Well, let us now resume an examination of the parody of the evolutionary uh, sequence. Before we look at the parody, though, we want to refresh our memory of what the original book looked like. Let's now take a look at the centerfold, if you call it that, from the Time Life book written by F. Clark Howell. Howell's foldout begins with Australopithecus, who becomes Heidelberg Man in Big Daddy. Then, next in line, we have Paranthropus, who becomes Nebraska Man in the comic book. Third, we have an advanced Australopithecus, who becomes the fourth figure in the comic and has his name changed to Peking Man. The fourth figure is Homo erectus, who somehow becomes the third figure in the comic book and is called Piltdown Man. The next three figures, early Homo sapiens, Solo Man, and Rhodesian Man, do not find their way into the comic book. Neanderthal Man, the third from the end here, is shown in the comic and he is identified correctly. Cro-Magnon Man and Modern Man complete Howell's sequence. Reviewing the centerfold of Big Daddy, we find cartoon copies of these forms. Chick's lineup begins with what he calls Heidelberg Man, whom we have already seen is really Australopithecus. Next, he gives us Nebraska Man, who in Howell's book was actually Paranthropus. 
Third in line, we have Peltdown Man, whose picture is really that of Homo erectus. Fourth in the comic book, we have Peking Man, who is really what Howells called an advanced Australopithecus. Then we have Neanderthal Man, and then someone called New Guinea Man. New Guinea Man is, as far as I can tell, still unknown to science, and where Chick got this picture or this idea is still a mystery. Well, New Guinea Man is followed by Cro-Magnon Man, spear and all, and then Modern Man, who has developed a pot belly in the process of evolving from his picture in the Time Life book. Well, let's now uh, resume our critique of the individual components of this, of this lineup. In part one, we already uh, examined what Chick has done with uh, uh, Heidelberg Man and so-called Nebraska Man. Let's now focus our attention on the case of Piltdown Man. The third picture in the Big Daddy centerfold is that of Piltdown Man. We've already noted that this was taken from Howell's illustration of Homo erectus. The caption reads, the jawbone turned out to belong to a modern ape. The invited inference here is that evolutionists, once again, are so dumb they can't tell an ape's jaw from a caveman's jaw. The fact of the matter, as you perhaps are aware, is that Piltdown Man actually was a deliberate hoax. We don't know who the prankster was in the teens of this century, but somebody put a skull and a, a jaw in a, in a gravel pit, and this was discovered, and it was thought to be an actual fossil of one of, human, of one of mankind's ancestors. At the time that this occurred, so few human ancestors actually had been discovered that there was really no good way to compare the Piltdown remains with anything else. And so these were just as plausible as ancestors as, as anything else. However, as the decades rolled by in the 20th century, and as more and more real human fossils and humanoid fossils were uh, excavated, the Piltdown remains began to stick out like a sore thumb. The message of evolution that the Piltdown remains seemed to be carrying just did not match up with the message of evolution that was being brought to light by fossil after fossil after fossil from all parts of the world. And in the 50s, a number of scientists decided that there was something radically wrong with, with Piltdown Man. Now, as a matter of fact, I should tell you that many scientists never really uh, thought Piltdown Man was, was much of anything. Uh, the Americans didn't go along with it that much, and the French didn't go along with it. It was mostly British scientists, because Piltdown Man was discovered in England, uh, who, who uh, focused on that. But anyway, by the 50s of this century, with new dating methods uh, possible, like the fluorine method and so on, it was discovered that the jaw was not fossilized at all, that actually the teeth had been filed down and the jaw had been stained with chemicals so that it would look old. And uh, it turns out that the jaw actually, indeed, as the comic book says, was a jaw of an ape. However, it didn't look that much like an ape because, as I've said, it was deliberately altered. The teeth had been changed and uh, various stains had been added to make it look like a fossil. Well, we don't know why uh, this prank was played, but it really doesn't matter because science advanced enormously uh, from, from uh, the exposure of this hoax. First of all, it made human evolution much more intelligible. Uh, Piltdown seemed to be saying that man's brain evolved before his jaw and body became human, whereas all the other fossils seem to show that man's brain was the last part of his anatomy to become fully human. The other thing is that Piltdown Man was exposed as a hoax because of evidence coming from evolutionary studies themselves. I told you earlier that science is a self-correcting system. It was not creationists who exposed the fraud of Piltdown Man. It was evolutionary scientists using the evidence of evolutionary investigations. Needless to say, after the exposure of Piltdown Man as a hoax, all the other fossils 
in the world of, of human ancestors were subjected to extremely careful study and testing to make sure that they too were not frauds. Well, the rest of them have come through with flying colors and consequently we can believe in the general picture of human evolution that has emerged with much greater assurance than perhaps we could have if we had not exposed the fraud of Piltdown Man. The next figure is that of Neanderthal Man. As far as we know, he was the anthropoid who first invented a god. The caption reads, at the International Congress of Zoology, 1958, Dr. A.J. E. Cave said his examination showed that the famous Neanderthal skeleton found in France over 50 years ago is that of an old man who suffered from arthritis. The invited inference here is that only one Neanderthal has ever been found, and he proved to be simply an ordinary Frenchman with arthritis. We are invited to conclude once again that scientists are a bunch of dummies who can't tell the bones of cavemen from those of a sick Frenchman. As always, the facts of the matter are somewhat different than what the creationists represent them to be. In reality, almost a hundred Neanderthal remains are known. Some of these are absolutely complete skeletons. In, in fact, some of them are burials. In fact, in some of these we have found the remains of flowers that were placed with the, the dead body. And it is from the presence of these flowers as well as other circumstantial uh, evidence that makes us conclude that Neanderthal man uh, believed in a life after death and therefore probably had a belief in some sort of deities. Cave's paper did not, in fact, dispute that Neanderthal man was a unique race of extinct uh, human beings. What Professor Cave simply showed was that the posture which we had thought was characteristic of Neanderthal man, it was thought that Neanderthal man had walked with a slight stoop, that in fact this was not the case, that the arthritis uh, which was present in this particular French example, uh, that the arthritis was causing a hunched over posture and that back in 1911 and 1913 when the great French paleoanthropologist Marcelin Boulle had studied this particular fossil, uh, Marcelin Boulle had underestimated the importance of the, uh, of the arthritis. By the way, Marcelin Boulle did know that that particular individual suffered from arthritis. Uh, this is not rare, by the way, in uh, creatures that live in caves. There are a number of other uh, examples of Neanderthal man that clearly had, had arthritis. Some of them had rickets. Some of them didn't have any of these diseases. Not only humans that lived in caves, by the way, uh, suffered arthritis. We know of some cave bears that also had arthritis. But I assure you that scientists can tell the difference between a Frenchman with arthritis and an extinct race of human beings, namely Neanderthal man. We now come to the end of the line to Chick's vision of modern man. As you can see from the pot belly, modern man has deteriorated since his residence in Howell's book. The caption here reads, this genius thinks we came from a monkey. We have a Bible verse also, one of the favorites among uneducated believers. Quote, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Romans 1, 22. The placement of this Bible verse at the end of Chick's comic book tips us off to the real motivations behind not only Chick, but creationists in general. Their concern is not really with what is true about the world. Their concern isn't really with science. Their concern is to try to convert people to a fundamentalist worldview. They have, it would seem, very few compunctions to cut and paste, to rearrange the facts of nature, as we have seen here in our analysis, to rearrange the facts of nature to fit their very narrow, literal reading of the Bible. They try to fit everything into this narrow mold this narrow biblical view. Hankering after simpler times, they really try to go back to a very, very ancient view of man and of the universe. The only sad thing is that they choose to call this view science.